help you find your seats or get more seats. There's maybe seats up front, but if you don't have your seats, guess what? Somebody else will occupy them, all right? I'm going to point out where you are. Uh, there. Phil? Uh, Phil, you're right. Good to see you. Gary, you're correct right there. Welcome everybody for this Minnesota GOP gubernatorial debate. I know it's not 7 o'clock, but I'm going to do some ground rules for everybody, if I may. I'm George, one of the moderators. And I'm going to make a quick announcement or two so you kind of get it up. So, I know you're all still talking and you're thinking this is still the social hour. So I'm going to ask you to now bring it down to a whisper. Or I can do this. Hey, let's bring it down to a whisper. Thank you very much. There we go. Okay. So, we have two volunteer ushers on this side and that side. They will have debate forms. Raise your hand. One, two. One on here, and one stand on this side, please, in the four corners. So when you're ready with a gubernatorial debate question, raise your hand, pass it to the end, and the person on the end will keep it up, and then they'll pick it up for you. They also will have additional blank debate questions. If you need more, just raise your hand, and I'll give you one. Fair enough? The, the ushers will bring the debate questions to Carrie Baiba, who will sort it and bring it to the moderators, right? Make sense? And we really love having you up here. We haven't officially started yet, so this is before the actual start at 7 o'clock. So a little bit of housekeeping. We're so glad you made the time in your life to come here tonight. I hope you're going to have some fun. I hope you're going to get engaged. Because the way we're going to uh, treat you guys is you will have no choice. You will be engaged. But anyways. Now. Some of the candidates, and there's also Dr. Bernal for Attorney General, and he'll speak for three minutes at the beginning, shortly after seven. All right, is that all fair for you guys? We need a good Attorney General, don't we? Yeah! yeah. So, housekeeping, who does not have a set of paperwork or forms? Raise your hand, somebody will get you a collated set. Or, we're all trusting each other because there's plenty of room in your seats to maneuver. So, as adults, turn off your cell phone or put it into a vibrate mode. If it rings and disturbs the meeting, what will happen is an usher will be coming to tap you on the shoulder and escorting you out to get that taken care of. Hi, Xavier. And take you out and then bring you back in when you're ready with your phone. Fair enough? The bathrooms. Upstairs is a set, and there's one right across the hall, men's and women's. For those of you who do not know the Southdale Library and how this layout is, right? So this is a public venue. we got to be out of here before 9 because the security guards will close and shut the gates and will close the doors. So what will happen is about 8.30, we're going to cut it down from two minutes to one minute closing remarks per my co-moderator, Sue Jeffers. About 8.30, 8.35 or so, one minute closing remarks. And then when we finish, if you want to volunteer, and make sure you place yourself around, you pick up everything, and there will be a couple garbage bags, black ones, volunteers that you can throw it in. And we'll collect it and bring it out, because we are very, very tidy in this organization, right? Tea Party folks are very tidy. So we are not going to leave a mess. The volunteers are cleaning up. If you haven't eaten and you came late from work, hey, by all means, hi, Glenn. There's the Brute Hagens over there sitting and just chatting away. Yes, we will. And we'll do that promptly at the beginning. We're all outside. Oh, by the way, George, I have some Zymers all the time. So you, sometimes you're going to have to forgive me if I forget a name or a specific date. I'm just kidding. What I'm saying is I'll do the best I can with the questions. If some of the questions are off of percentage point or numbers slightly off, take in mind the concept that we're trying to ask 
And don't get so picky on the exact error that we didn't say was 72.3, it was supposed to be 74. Right? Or something like that. That comes up. Or we say the date was 2008 and you knew it was 2009. Please forgive us because I'm not researching every question for this debate in their suit. But kind of, kind of flow with us. This is a friendly audience. How many of you in this room are not a member or do not vote for the Republican Party of Minnesota? How many of you in this room do not vote Republican? <laughs> All right, so we already carried it you out. <laughs> it's okay if you're not a Republican. We love to grow our numbers. How many of you hold the old story? When you're young, you go through the public school system, we're naturally going to want what? World peace, no hunger in the world, shelter for every child, right? As we get older, you start a family, you go, wait a minute. What's this take out on my, you know, my, my check? And then as you start trying to figure out how to pay your bills, you know, a lot of people become conservative with their values, and that's where we get a lot of Republicans as they age. There is always an exception to that. What about those young people who make multi millions of dollars in sports or music or uh, Hollywood acting? And they don't get that progression, right? We see a lot of young people in their 20s and 30s with mega millions. And they're still the same as if they're a child and have no concept with their comments attacking all of us. Whether you're a veteran, a conservative, a libertarian, a constitutionalist, a Republican, right? Whether you're for, for life, whether you're for the Second Amendment, whether you're for certain values in the Bill of Rights, we're being attacked. And that's not going to stop. So it's five to seven. How many veterans are in the room? Wow. Look at that. We all call it. All right. Thank you. Okay. One of you, when we stand up, will be leading our Pledge of Allegiance, right? You can come right up now as a volunteer and we'll give you the microphone. So one of you just steps right forward as a military vet, please. And we're going to start that shortly. After the Pledge of Allegiance, Glenn, would you be so honored to come up? Sure. Where's the bed? No, no, I'm talking not one of the candidates. I appreciate it so much. We have another veteran This is representing Blue Nation. He's so good on five different issues. But if his name comes up, pardon me for you know, loving him so much, and he may be measured regarding the health care issue. What a question. Now, when we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance right behind us, and notice there's no gold fringes on that flag. Ask us or somebody within our tea party about that later. Then please remain standing as John Bergen, our co-founder of our local We the People of Bloomington, Edina, Richfield Tea Party crew. That's us. Well, we just use the first initial of each word. It's a mouthful, right? You can find us on Facebook. So John will be coming up right afterwards to give us a vacation. And please remain standing after the invitation because I'm going to ask each and every one of you to say hello to two or three people that you have not yet met. Just you know, greet and say hi to them before you sit down. We will begin. And we will also tell everyone you're going to have a lot of fun. And then what will happen is we'll have a three minutes and we'll kind of determine ourselves, Sue and I, who will go first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And that's going to take anywhere from, what, 16 to 18 minutes because there's time to sit down and stand up. Where's our timekeeper tonight? If we don't have that person here, we're going to have to draft one of you. Gary, <laughs> who's our timekeeper? Thank you. Ring the bell. <coughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. I don't have to go there are some volunteer campaign tables on around the side of the room. Feel free. If you quietly stand up to go back or quietly take yourself to maybe visit toward the end because you haven't had a chance to do it before 7 o'clock, feel free to do so quietly on your own. We have the Republican Roundtable television crew here tonight with two cameras. The smaller one will be zooming in on the speaker, who's when they're speaking. The larger one will be more of a hand shot. 
and they will make this available or maybe play it. Who else do we have here from a cable access TV? Rick Brack, stand up, raise your hand. Yeah, so he does network. one from Minneapolis. Yeah, right from Minneapolis Television Network. Okay. <laughs> but that's kind of fun. We also have a talk show personality who's the show host tonight. So Jeffers, give her a call. All right. Dear God, as we're gathered together in this room, where there are two or more of us that trust you, you know your spirit is here with us. The spirit of truth and the spirit of knowledge of the future. And as we gather together in the scriptures, it is written in Isaiah 17. Damascus would be totally destroyed. Prophecy has now come to pass and is almost finished. Also, when you talked to Moses on Mount Sinai, you gave him the plan for peace on earth to all mankind. It wasn't the Ten Commandments. Moses broke them. But he gave him the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. I give you the most important thing you're going to learn in your life this evening. What God gave to Moses was the most powerful thing ever given to a human being. Because in Agenda 21, if you, 
your state, and your nation is righteous. God will give you rain in due season, healthy food, healthy cattle, healthy people, and peace in your nation. Your enemies will flee from you. And this weekend, we noticed we had about a foot and a half of snow in Minnesota. It's a preview of things to come, ladies and gentlemen. When I was in Amman, Jordan, years ago, I was talking to 23 men that ran the country. And I said, the two more world wars, three and four, are going to be in your backyard. I have no fear. God's angels will come down with snow and giant hail, 100 pound weight. And 83% of Russia's and Iran's troops will die. There'll be no more. The general stood up, he said, Mr. John, it's 120 degrees in the shade. How can you talk like that? I said, my friend, because I know the future. I'm a time traveler. The general called me back about a little over a month later, asking me to fly back to Amman. I said, General, I gave your king the Bible. He knows everything he needs to know. I gave your wife seven books. She'll read the books to you. I don't have to come back and hold your hand anymore. The general begged me, please, Mr. John, come back. I went back. You know what happened? They had nine feet of snow. <laughs> That's how God's army works. The angelic army uses snow and giant hail. Now, as these individuals are willing to come forward to bring our state the land of 10,000 lakes, to bring our state back to where it belongs, a righteous state by all the blessings. And as you go home this evening, I tell this to everybody wherever I know when I meet them. If you want to find out who you really are and where you're going to spend eternity, God give you a message. Read one book of Psalms and one of Proverbs, just a verse a day. You'll find out who you are. And now because we're going to hear these ladies and gentlemen talk about what they're going to do for our country, I ask each and every one of you to ask a blessing on them and let them be victorious. We thank you for all these great things you're doing, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the God of all gods. Amen. Amen. Let's greet somebody. Two or three people. It was the for greeting everybody. A little bit more housekeeping. So, does anybody who do not have a pen or pencil raise your hand? Ushers will get you one because we, not, we need you to be active. So, the library has pencils and I brought pens. So, ushers, our registration table. There's a couple hands over here that need pens or pencils. 
Um, keep your hands up if you don't have all the forms either besides pen and paper. We need you to consider this. Pull out your survey sheet, everybody. On your survey sheet, on the top corner, write your name. If you don't want to put your last name, that's fine. First name, add something to that below there, please. And that is, who were you referred by or who brought you here tonight? We really like to know. That really helps. In your survey sheet, used to be one through five, now it's one through ten. Keep your hands up if you don't have sheets. Uh, registration table. Ushers, we get them to these people who do not have their paperwork. Thank you. We gotta get moving here. Keep your hands up. Next, turn in your questionnaires. You know how the ushers will pick them up and give you more questionnaires. If we have to, we'll use blank packs of flyers and pens or whatever if we get overflow of questions. Next, not everybody's question will be asked. We'll categorize it as quickly as possible. Well, thank you for being here. And let's see. Any other housekeeping item? I, if I forget, that's what I'll do. I'll forget. But then I'll maybe remember again. So, what I'd like to do for tonight, when we start, Rick, were you able to get the library to turn off the heat and turn the air on, maybe? Were you able to do that? Okay. Good, because the temperature's gone up 15 degrees. Everybody knows that. These two hands are still up. There's a lady with her hands up there. Any other ushers? Come on, let's run up here. Ushers, grab the paperwork and give them the stuff. They need paperwork. Thank you. Now, I'm going to start this to starting easy tonight. We'll do this. I'm going to look at topics. And by the way, I want to set for each of the candidates, including survey questions and the the big question. The candidates are always one, right? So please, somebody run up here and give the candidates each one of them. Now, where's this? All right, category. If you look at your questionnaire, there's all bunch of categories, and Carrie was able to be kind enough and some did some of it. What I'm going to do for the first five minutes is do this before I turn it over to my co moderator, Sue Jeffers. Can we keep the voices down to zero now? Oh, we got a good crowd tonight. I know that, but we'll get, we'll get cut out. What we're going to do is ask everybody right now for a moment of silence because we just announced about half an hour ago or so, Barbara Bush has died. So let's have a moment of silence right now. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Give you your prayers for the Bush family and those in their full circle. Can we mention she had bourbon last night? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Sue will tap in order of one, two, three, four, five. Who's going to come up here for speaking? And as they make their way, number two will come up. And by the way, the candidates can submit questions as well. Yes? No, go for it. Yes? And you have your three minutes and their timer will be timing. Oh, we have one. I'm sorry. See, I forgot. We have two announcements. Doug Wardle will make your way through front. You got two, three minutes. And if you're not here right now, we'll give this gentleman one minute right now. Come here, sir. Oh, we're waiting for Doug Wardle. Oh, I don't want to keep I don't want to keep Doug uh, waiting here, but uh, I'm with the Freedom Club. Uh, some of you are already with the Freedom Club. We pay people, uh, no matter who your favorite candidate is today, we will pay you to go door to door. We will pay you to make phone calls. We're, uh, we've made, uh, next month we'll have made um, one million personal contacts between doors and uh, phone calls already for this cycle. We pay you to do that. Uh, so uh, make MinnesotaRed.com or come see me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Short and sweet. That's what we want to hear. Okay, uh, let's keep this on track, but I want you guys to meet the greatest candidate ever, Doug Wardlow, running for Attorney General. You know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take my word for it. He is great. He's been on my show several times. He'll be on many more times. He needs money, so would you guys open up your checkbook? 
fork out some money to him. Maybe you want to pick one or two of these guys to give some money to as well. But let me, it's my pleasure to introduce the next Attorney General of the great state of Minnesota, Doug Ortho. Yes, Doug Ortho running for Attorney General. I'll be brief. So President Trump wants to add a question to the census about citizenship. That's a good thing, it makes sense, right? Yeah. The, um, the point is to identify hot spots of illegal voting. Yeah. So if you have, say, 100,000 votes in a particular area, but then you have, I'm sorry, 100,000 citizens in a particular area, we have 150,000 votes, so there's a problem with illegal voting. Now, Lori Swanson, our attorney general for the last 11 years. So Lori Swanson has been our Attorney General for the last 11 years. Democrats have held this office for 46 years. Wow. Lori Swanson disagrees with this common sense proposal of our president. And so she has joined Minnesota to a lawsuit with other states to oppose this ballot question. I'm sorry, the census question. This is a completely basis, baseless lawsuit. So she is abusing the powers of her office and she is wasting taxpayer dollars to sue the president once again for entirely political purposes. So I'm running for Attorney General to take the politics out of the office, to stand up for the rule of law, to stand up for the Constitution, and to limit government, to restore law and order in Minnesota. Just briefly, my background, I'm a constitutional attorney with Alliance Defending Freedom, and that's a conservative Christian law firm, and we defend religious liberty and free speech and rights of conscience in cases across the country. So I'm going to bring that focus on constitutional rights, defending our fundamental freedoms, to the office of the Attorney General. So we're going to stand up for constitutional rights. You might not realize it, but there are nearly 200 attorneys that work in the office of the Attorney General. And for 46 years, the attorneys in that office have been pushing the Democrats' big government agenda. So just imagine what we can do when we refocus those attorneys. First of all, we're going to get rid of 46 of them that are appointed, make the other ones reader for the interview for their jobs. And then we're going to focus them on liberty government and standing up for liberty, standing up for the rule of law. And we can do that on day one. Because the Attorney General's office is an independent constitutional office that isn't beholden to the legislature or the governor or the judiciary. It exists in our state, the framers intended it this way, the, the framers of the Minnesota Constitution, to stand up, to be a bulwark against more government and abuse and to stand up for the rule of law. So that's what we're going to do. We can push back to the regulatory state. The Attorney General can give a thumbs up or thumbs down to any regulation. So that means we can lift the burden of regulations off the job creators. We can fight for election integrity on day one going to create a unit within the office of the Attorney General to actually enforce our election laws. We're going to send a message that if you pass an illegal ballot in the state intentionally, you're going to go to jail. Yeah. 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 And just by doing that one thing, it's going to change the way government and politics works in Minnesota for the long term. It is the key to turning Minnesota red for the long term. So, again, Doug Wardlow running for Attorney General. It's a statewide race. We need more attention on the Attorney General's race. We haven't held this office for quite a while, but I think we have, we have a, a great opportunity. So please, open up your checkbook, checkbooks. Cash contributions are also accepted. Uh, fill up those volunteer cards, those blue cards you see going around. There's a survey in the back as well, and return to the table over here. And I would really appreciate your support. I'm the only Republican in the race. So you can get on board with our team today. No need, no need to think about it too much. So, very good. Doug Wardle for Attorney General. God bless. Doug Wardlow, great candidate. Next up, Jennifer's going to tell us about Robert Barnheiser. Barnheiser, who's running for Senate. Thank you. This is actually my hometown. I grew up about six blocks from here in the same house that my mother grew up in. She's been there since 1952, and she and my dad are actually both battling cancer together there. She has no intention of leaving. So I love this neighborhood, so it's nice to be back. My name is Jen Eisenbarth. I'm the campaign manager for Rob Barnheiser for U.S. Senate. Uh, three minutes, not a lot of time. You're going to be inundated with a lot of information. So my job today is to leave you with one thing. Can you remember this? You are right. Yes, I was, Miss Richfield. I have a parade way <laughs> waiting for you. <laughs> so uh, the one thing that you need to leave here remembering, and to remember all the way through November, is that Amy Klobuchar is beatable. Yeah. Yeah. She is. And I'm going to quickly go through the three reasons why 
Barnheiser, Bra Barnheiser is the only candidate who can beat her. Okay? The first one is, Rob Barnheiser is a former pastor. He's a natural uniter. If you haven't had an opportunity to speak with him, reach out to him. He'll call you, he'll meet with you. Any concerns you have, that's him. He's a uniter. The second reason is he is a small business owner for more than 25 years. And in being a small business owner, anybody who's run a business, that was three minutes? One minute. One minute. Oh, you're so oh, you're so Keep no, going. Okay, anyway, let's give her a round. Let's give her at least let her give the contact information. Okay, can I, can I just, I'm, I'll be quick. I got her talking with my senior class in Richfield, so it's all good. You guys, the second thing is that small business owner, he negotiates, closes deals. The third thing, the main thing that you need to remember is that he actually can get the votes that Trump missed. Trump missed because he did not get the inner city. Robert is Hispanic. He's going into the inner city. He's going into forums where there's Latinos. And he says, you know what? The one thing I have to under you have to understand is that your parents raised you with our cultural values. But you one thing they made an error on is they raised you as a Democrat because you're a minority, because you've been struggling financially. You've been sold that you are a Democrat. And guess what? You're not. You're a Republican. How many of you here believe in God? Yeah. How many of you here believe in life begins at conception? How many of you here, goes down the thing, and he said, how many of you here think you might actually be a Republican? He is changing not only the 40% of people who don't identify with a Democrat or a Republican, he's getting their votes, but he's also changing people who have always voted Democratic, he's turning them into Republicans. Check him out, go on Facebook, you guys, it's amazing. Thank you. Okay, next up we're going to start with a three-minute uh, introduction of each of our gubernatorial candidates, except for Tim Valenti, who is not here. I guess these people will put him outside the bubble. I know, I know, I know. We have somebody suggested I sit in for Tim Valenti. Oh, what fun that would have been. Uh, anyways, now, I think judging from your response, candidates, you understand, no BS. We want to hear what you're really thinking, what you're going to do. Why can we trust you? Who are you? That's what we want to hear. Plus, we've got really hard questions for you. Which, by the way, most of them are in the packet in front of you. All right, first up, Bill Parrish. Hey, all right. A lot of familiar faces. I've been in with several of you throughout the last year, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much, and thanks for setting us up. Thanks for all the work that you do. Well done. Uh, those of you that don't know me, um, born and raised in southern Minnesota, went to college at Mankato State, then Mankato State, now Minnesota State, K-12 music teacher for 13 years, got a principal license, I specialize in emotional behavioral disorders. In the midst of my education career, I had joined the Navy Reserve. I had nine and a half years as an intelligence specialist, enlisted, and then was offered a direct commission as an intelligence officer, and I specialize uh, in counterterrorism and foreign policy. What's that got to do with running for governor? In my last set of orders, I was in a situation where I was working with law enforcement partners throughout the nation in a, in a, in a team that specialized in going after kind of the who, what, when, where, and why and making sure we got in front of terrorist organizations, their funding and their movement of, movement of people and, and weapons. And that led back to Minnesota. Believe it or not, it led back to Minnesota a lot. And the more I know over the last 20 years, the more it's bothered me. And I can't just go home and shut the door. It's just not part of who I am. It's not my, how my mother raised me. I can't just go home and shut the door and pretend that we don't have money laundering schemes going on in Minnesota to pay for terrorists inside the US and overseas. Human trafficking going on in Minnesota that is connected even to Syria. That we have terrorists traveling at will out of Minneapolis International Airport back and forth to terrorist organizations overseas. These kinds of things can't be tolerated. So it's not just about terrorist activity. The immigration and refugee resettlement programs need to stop. We can end it, we can do it, we will do it. We need to make sure we get on top of the taxation schemes that are driving 30 to 33% of our retirees and, and senior citizens out of the state. We can end the social security tax. We can get on top of our education system and making sure that we eliminate Common Core and this indoctrination into the socialist Marxist culture that has got to be the most ridiculous thing we've been putting up with for decades. And we can get that 
to a healthcare system that actually provides health care. Health insurance and access is not care. Woo! Right? All right. Three minutes. I'm going to wrap it up because we got a lot more we can say when we're in our in the forum here. But I'm Philip Parrish. I'm so grateful for so many faces I see uh, over the last year that I've visited with and I see on social media. I would love to tell you a lot more, but you can get a lot more information at the table. And those of you that do know me, please pass the word to your friends that may not know me and, and get them on board with what's going on. Thank you very much. Philip Parrish. In November, Minnesotans will elect a new governor. But let's look back at history for a minute. You know it's been 12 years since a Republican has won a statewide office. Our state has changed, our politics have changed, but our candidates haven't. The score during that time is Democrats 14, Republicans 0. My fellow Republicans, I propose we do something different. I propose we win. Yeah. Yes. Right. I'm Mary Giuliani Stevens and I'm running for governor to bring new solutions and bold leadership to the challenges in health care, education, taxes, transportation, and the many other issues we face in this state. I'm running because it's time for Republicans to do something differently with a different candidate who brings a different perspective and different experience, and who can win. And I'm that candidate. But don't just take my word for it. A DFL operative told a Star and Tribune reporter, and I quote, their shy should be terrified of Woodbury Mayor Mary Giuliani Stevens. The mayor of the fast-growing East Metro suburb is running for governor. A smart, sensible suburban woman is the type of GOP candidate who can crack their statewide losing streak, this DFL source fears, end quote. I've been the mayor of Woodbury, Minnesota for eight years. In my first election, I received 54% of the vote in a six-person race. Four years later, I ran unopposed. I know how to campaign, I know how to win. When I ran for mayor, I ran to accomplish three things. One, job creation. Jobs have increased over 17%. Economic development. When you let the free market work, over 320 new businesses in just the last five years. An efficient and effective government, which has led Woodbury to continue to be one of the fastest growing cities in the state and continue to be recognized as one of the best places to live, not only in Minnesota, but in the United States as well. As governor, I'll put into practice what I learned as mayor. And one of the first things I learned is that sometimes the best public policy is just to get government out of the way. Not only out of our wallets, but from infringing our liberties. Thank you, I look forward to our discussion this evening. Well, thank you all for being here. I am Jeff Johnson, running for governor. A little background on me. I was born and raised in Detroit Lakes. My wife is from Crookston. We've been in Plymouth for uh, 25 years, I think it is. I've spent most of my adult life in the private sector, the last 17 years being self-employed. And then also during that time, I served six years in the Minnesota House, and now I'm in my third and final term on the Hennepin County Board. Any Hennepin County taxpayers in here? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we, we actually, Tuesdays are board days where we meet, so we met today. I am usually in a minority of one, but we lost four to three today, so we had a little party. So you've got to be happy about the small steps in life. Uh, I, I got in this race almost a year ago for a really simple reason. To give you control over your own money, over your own property, over your own health care, over your own kids' education, and frankly, over your own lives. I was actually talking to a reporter a while back, and I'd just been kind of hammering on the Democrats about a lot of different things. And at one point, he said to me, do you have anything in common with the DFL? And I said, sure, we both want to control my life. And unfortunately, that's where we are right now. And that's why this election is so important. We have to change that. And I'm excited to talk to you about a lot of specific ways that we'll be doing that over the next you know, hour and 15 minutes. But I can boil it down to something pretty simple. We are going to make fundamental 
generational change to a system that has become arrogant and out of touch and is completely broken. We're going to change the very culture in St. Paul from that of telling everybody else how to live our lives to actually serving the people who pay our salaries. So for starters, we're going to dismantle the Met Council. Once we're going to rein in the DNR and the MPCA and the Department of Health and every other bureaucracy that doesn't understand their sole purpose to exist is to serve us, not to control us. We're going to clean house in our state agencies and give people their government back in this state. So thank you for having us tonight and I look forward to talking more. Hello, uh, my name is Keith Downey. And a uh, quick question, how many of you are ready for a new governor? <laughs> Me too. And how many of you are ready for a politician who actually says what they mean and then does what they said? Yeah. Yeah, me too. I want to take you back to 2007 when I decided to run for state representative just east or west of here against an incumbent, 18-year incumbent Republican named Ron Earhart. Ooh. This was before it was fashionable to take on incumbent Republicans who had lost their way. And I did. And on caucus night, we got my delegates elected over his to the point where I was darn close to having the endorsement, winning it the old-fashioned way through the endorsement. And I started making calls through my delegate list. And I got to Precinct 16, and there was a name that I didn't know. And it was George Wu. <laughs> and I called George Wu in the middle of the day, and we talked for probably an hour, maybe two. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe it was three, if I remember. I'm not precise on the numbers tonight. And George, to his credit, after we got to know each other, he asked me how many delegates I needed him to deliver at our caucus, or at our convention, so that I could actually win the endorsement. And guess what? He delivered every single one. All right. Yeah. And then, in the general election, George modeled it out and said, how many votes do you need in Precinct 16 in order to win the election? We figured it out, and guess what? George delivered every single one. All right. Yeah. And I went on into the legislature, riding that momentum, and did everything that I said, and made my promises complete to the people of Minnesota and to people like George Wu, sometimes to my detriment politically. And so when my wife and I sat down and decided whether or not I would run for governor, we thought long and hard, we prayed long and hard, and we decided that if I did, that I had to tell the people of Minnesota exactly what I think and exactly what I would do and commit to them that if they elected me, that they would have somebody in the governor's office who had said what they meant and was going to do what they said. All right. And that's how we've been running this race. We have put out really bold proposals, a 15% reduction in state spending. A 15% reduction, I'll say it again. All right. Tax and regulatory relief. Vouchers for the families who have kids in failing schools, yeah. fundamental reform to our health care, and all of these are exactly what we need. I'm a business guy originally, I got into politics late in life, and I can tell you that is exactly what our state needs in order to turn this thing around and for all of Minnesota's native strengths to shine through again. But I'm telling you, that is not how we win this election. That is not. People are so sick and tired of the political class and government and they're losing confidence in our institutions. We have a chance to go out and fight for average everyday people, do what we said, say what we mean. That is how we win the election. And if that's the kind of candidate you want, the kind of governor you want, I'd love to be it. Thank you. When you're far on the left, you have to come all the way to the right. <laughs> As you all know, there are two Johnsons that are running for governor this year. And I like Jeff. He's always been very cordial to me. I'm always flattered when I'm here when many people come up to me and ask me, are you Jeff's younger brother? <laughs> I want everyone to know that I endorse 100% Doug Wardle for Attorney General. I'm going to be 
take a whole different approach. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself. There are three important things I want you to know about me that will impact how I conduct myself. God loves me unconditionally, forever. I didn't always obey him, and he kind of slapped me in the line a few times. I didn't like it. But I had to get up and keep going. So I'm grateful to God. Secondly, about 14 years ago, I met my current wife, Jan, and I call her my sweetie Sapphire. And shortly after I asked, met her, I asked her what I could do to help her. And she said the same thing that God taught me. She said, Lance, just love me unconditionally forever. Well, for a Norwegian, that's particularly difficult. <laughs> so God loves me, and she asked me to love her unconditionally forever. And I have a 36-year-old son. His name is Dan. He does not want to be involved in this campaign under any circumstances. However, if you ask him, does your father love you unconditionally forever? And is he always there? He will tell you absolutely and unequivocally. And when I make a promise to you, I will be there unconditionally forever also. I will not get knocked knee and say, we should turn and run. So this is the year of the woman in the Republican Party. I have stated everywhere I speak two central issues for me. If someone rapes a woman or sexually molests a child, in my opinion, they effectively take a part of that person's life. And they should go to jail for life. Yeah. Well, we all need to be sensitive to women and what they can contribute to our campaign. I nominated and helped elect the first and only president for the Minnesota Real Estate Exchange Commission. And Neil Friedman, my good friend who was president one time, can confirm that. There's someone else I met here tonight, he told me in front of somebody else, if Lance tells you X, it will be X. So I want you to know campaign, Johnson will have women in my campaign. And I'm gonna have a running mate who is a woman. She's intelligent and she's smart and she'll give you her speaking anytime. She's here tonight. I'd like to introduce my new running mate, your Lieutenant Governor, Michelle Eden. <laughs> to run with Lance. I, the thing I like about Lance is uh, he doesn't have political baggage, and I think we're going to be a great team together. Thank you. Being floated around the nation, 
state by state to be ratified and if they vote for it. <coughs> if it passes and a convention of states is called upon, if you're elected governor, would you send somebody to represent your position from the executive branch or would you be opposed to the convention of states? Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution. By raising your hands, opposed. If a convention of states is called upon and agreed upon by the so-called number of minimum states, the 50 states, I think it's 35, if they agree to have a convention of states, would you be participating, yes or no, if you're a governor, or in fact, maybe sending a delegate to represent? No, raise your hand. Yes, raise your hand. So again, we don't know. We have two people that don't know, and I don't want to elaborate right now because but you wouldn't have a choice. A true convention of states is governor wouldn't have a choice. Correct. Correct. It is a simple question. It's not a trick question. Thank you for clarifying. This is the easy questions, right, that I'm asking right now. But thank you, Phil. Regarding the right to work under government, under, under uh, revenues, jobs, Wisconsin and other states, have, after winning a majority and Governor Walker, a Republican, taking office, they quietly passed and he signed the right to work. Which means, basically, if you're a human being eligible to work and you want to work, you have the right to work in that state without having to be forced into a union. <coughs> I'm not going to go into details. So, if we have the collective body of will with the state house and the state senate and the governor in charge for the next eight years, right? That's on our side. Would you be willing, if it was brought to your attention, would you sign that bill if it was passed? Yes or no? Yes? Right to work. There you have it. <laughs> Second Amendment. New Hampshire are very few states. You do not need a permit or license or registration to apply to carry a gun, a handgun, or a rifle nor do you need to apply with a local county sheriff. I could be wrong in some of my statements, so you can check about it, you know, fact check me later, but I'm saying this from the top of my head, my history, right? So, New Hampshire allows you to be able to have concealed carry without applying. It's a live, free, or die state. We have concealed carry in this state. We have a movement from some Parkland High School people that want to nullify or constrict with gun control. Conversely, the state of Texas has passed a school marshal bill where they have school marshals that are not identified carrying guns in their schools. But you don't know who they are. They're not no free gun zones. Since they passed it, <laughs> no, that's correct, that's correct. That's ready to start. Finish this, finish this, right? Since they passed that, have you heard of a single school shooting in the state of Texas? Something for us to think about. Would you consider school marshal and school safety as a way for our public schools in the state of Minnesota? If you're governor, would you if not pass it? Would you consider the people from the families, the local communities, bringing your attention to the elections commission site? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you very much. My time is up.
If you get rid of the statewide business property tax, of which yeah. we're only one of a few states that has one, we can get rid of the corporate income tax. We yeah. can do a cross the board income tax rate relief. We can do substantial uh, top tier rate relief for those people who pass their small business income through to their individual income taxes. And we could get rid of the $2 billion tax increase that the Democrats passed in 2013, and we still have enough money left over for an infrastructure program that I have proposed to focus on roads and bridges, water, wastewater, and broadband. So if you have the will, and you know how to do it, and have a plan to actually cut spending, you can do a lot with taxes. But if you don't, and you aren't prepared to say how you will cut spending, then don't talk about cutting taxes because it's an empty promise and you've heard it a thousand times from Republicans and Democrats about how they're gonna cut taxes. They have no idea how they're gonna do it. They're gonna walk into the governor's office without a plan. They're gonna get run over by the entrenched special interest. They won't be able to get it done and you won't see the tax relief. So we'll start at this end and work our way down this time. Uh, with all the surpluses we have, because the people of Minnesota are overtaxed, <laughs> what will you do to stop spending and taxes? I can't really read the writing here. <laughs> what will you do to cut spending and taxes to stop this? The first thing we're going to do with cutting spending and taxes is make sure that we our social services programs are stopped being exploited. The second thing we're going to do is make sure that the 10 committees who are proposing these omnibus bills every year and getting them passed without any uh, uh, pushback at all is going to end and just right. We're going to make sure that anytime those things come to our desk, it's make sure that we're not going to we're going to veto it, not sign it. The th third thing we're going to do is make sure that uh, the mic works. <laughs> okay. The third thing we're going to do is make sure that. Um, Completely threw my train of thought off. Um, yeah, so it, oh, so there's an automatic increase that's built into the budget immediately. That increase is going to end. We're going to make sure that fruit is frozen immediately. So again, we're on the right track. 
we're going to make sure that these things, you're going to hear a lot of us say the same thing. We're going to make sure this time that our money's where our mouth is, right? We're going to make sure that it gets done properly. And we're going to stop giving everybody a bunch of nonsense that everything is going to be all, all fine. It's not. We're going to make sure we mean what we say and do what we, we'll do what we say. Taxes and spending. So my goal is to get Minnesota out of the top 10 in all of our major tax categories, or two, three, and four in every one of them. We can get rid of the we can get rid of the social tax on social security. Um, that is so doable. And the estate tax, Governor Dayton wants to not even let it roll up to the three million that it's supposed to be at, let alone reconcile it with federal tax law. So we have got to make sure we at least get to reconciliation, if not eliminate that to altogether. With respect to the other end, on budgeting, I'm going for performance-based or target-based budgeting. Not to take the time to audit everything, but the budget's not gonna go up every, every year just because that was a program that was in there. If it, each, each agency is gonna have mission-critical, high-impact priorities, and if those items do not perform, they're gone. And so budgeting will be based on performance, not on automatic increases each year. With respect to cutting taxes, the first place you're going to start is health and human services. Yeah. I guess I'm going to come back to talking about those areas. And when another question, I'll get it in. Thank you. So I, I talked briefly about spending. I want to touch on taxes because we're in the top 10 in almost every single major tax category. My top priority for taxes, though, will be the income tax. Our top rate, that new rate that the DFL created a few years back, I believe is 85% higher than the average top rate in the country, which is a huge problem because it drives out wealth and investment. But I have a much bigger problem with our bottom income tax rate in Minnesota. Our bottom income tax rate, which applies to anybody who makes over $10,350 a year, is higher than the highest rate in 22 other states. Yeah, wow. That's insane. So we're not just taxing to death the CEO in Minnesota, we're taxing to death the mechanic and the school teacher and the daycare worker and the, every struggling small business person, and that will be my top priority tax-wise. I also believe we need an automatic taxpayer refund in this state so that when uh, Minnesotans are overtaxed and we do have a projected surplus because more came in than what we said we needed, it actually goes back to the taxpayers. Well, I just want to draw people's attention to the fact that uh, we still haven't heard anything specific. And if you want an explainer in chief or a describer in chief, that's not me. I'll be a chief executive. And I'm going to tell the people of Minnesota exactly what we can do to make government smaller, cheaper, and better. And I'll list some of these things here because nobody else will. And they've all talked about cutting taxes, they've all talked about doing these things. But no one actually has a plan for how to do it. And I'm here to tell you, sorry, but if you go into state government on a four-year term and say, we're going to start auditing things, and then your audit takes years to get the data out of the bureaucracy, and then the Democrats have five different competing audits going that are showing the exact opposite thing about how they need to grow these programs, you're going to be at the end of your term, and you won't even have started. No wonder we have politicians that never deliver the goods. I'll tell you the 16 specific places on another, on another answer. But I'm telling you, people, you got to know what you want to do when you go in there, and you can't just be describing this stuff. You have to have a plan, and you have to know how to go into big bureaucracies and reduce them and actually improve the service to get smaller, cheaper, and better. That's what I'll do. I am the only candidate who has never voted to increase your real estate taxes. I am the only candidate who has never <laughs> voted to increase your income taxes. I am the only candidate who has not enacted some sort of a fee increase for the state of Minnesota, transfer fee on a boat or a car or some other one, consistently throughout the years. And I'm the only candidate who has not had an opportunity to eliminate the tax on your social security benefits and it takes you to go to your legislators. Chief is right on one point. The chief cannot do it by himself. You need to go to your legislators and have them sponsor legislation eliminating the tax on Social Security benefits. I think the seniors are intelligent enough to spend their own money. <laughs> they don't need to have the state collect it, charge a commission to redistribute it to someone else. 
So that's the answer. You start by eliminating that. That will cost about a billion dollars, according to my information. It will require an adjustment by reducing other spending to give relief to Social Security recipients. I never voted for the three things you mentioned. Jeff? Same here. Um, Mary? I set a levy. I don't determine the taxes. My taxes went down this year. Don't get me started on Ramsey County. <laughs> 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 All right. Yes? I'm not a politician. I wasn't a politician. I will never be a politician. I'm a statesman and I've never increased any taxes. All right. <laughs> What are you going to put on the credit card? And having been mayor for eight years, I watch the bonding bill come down every year, and I look through the projects, and I really am aghast at the types of things that we borrowed for to bond on. And so I'm okay with bonding for infrastructure improvements that are regional, but not for the, the, the projects after projects after projects that get approved in the bonding. Absolutely not. I, I wouldn't allow it, I, I'd veto it. Yeah, obviously bonding is debt, and <laughs> suggested isn't is kind of a contortion that uh, lawyers have made out. Uh, I do believe there's a role for bonding if you have a statewide or regional project that is of a long period. So 
a new highway, a bridge replacement, maybe a, a water infrastructure project or something like that, I think that that is actually an appropriate use of bonding. To be getting anywhere near a billion dollars is just silliness. Um, I think probably half that is, is higher than what it should be. Uh, so I will support bonding for truly regional or statewide long-term projects, but most of our bonding bills are just chock full of local goodies that are put in in order to get the votes to pass the bonding bill, which is also how we get votes on our omnibus bills. You just keep throwing things in until you have enough votes to pass it, and I will not support that as governor. Yeah, I agree actually with those uh, statements. And actually, I had proposed a uh, capital investment uh, reform piece of legislation when I was in the legislature uh, that would require every bonding project that came before the le legislature to have a private sector like capital investment uh, analysis done on it because it's not. These are all political work projects, and Jeff is exactly right. The way you get the bonding bill passed is by throwing more stuff into it to get more and more votes. Uh, so that's absolutely upside down. They need to justify. Uh, these projects and they need to be statewide infrastructure projects. Another thing that I would change, which most people don't even know, uh, when I first got in the legislature, uh, bonding indebtedness was limited to 3% of the general fund. And so that annual debt service amount could not exceed 3% of our general fund revenue. And they changed it administratively so that it was 3% of all funds. And all funds, when you throw in the federal money, the highway money, the gambling money, all this stuff, it actually doubles it. And so debt service is actually the single largest increasing item uh, in our budget. It's certainly not the biggest, but it is the trajectory of, of increasing at the greatest amount. You put that 3% of general fund cap back on and you will automatically put a governor on this thing. You impose some of the requirements that I mentioned before. Uh, you really put a cap on it. Absolutely. Let him talk. I said it was an administrative rule. I did. It's just a gentleman's agreement. There's no rule. I mean, I this job this time, sir. I'm sorry. Nothing like a little excitement in here, right? Woo! Self-care, subject. Still has a couple questions from the audience. I'm sorry, go ahead, finish, I'm sorry. I'll be short and sweet. I would, I would oppose it initially, here's why. We have plenty of money, $40 billion. We better figure out where to find the money by cutting out other waste to pay for some of these projects that people think should be bondable. Bill will be asking a couple questions, but before she does, the subject is health care. I want to bring up a couple statements and it's going to be a lightning round before we have her. And she's going to do it combined so that the scanner should be less than half a minute. Okay, healthcare. We know how a disaster it has been, sure, but also other answers have been done. You got allopathic, you got homeopathic, you got chiropractors, you got mental health. It's a huge issue. The Obamacare, so Affordable Care Act, is supposed to take up one sixth of our economy. We hate it. Right? If it wasn't for Al Franken on the recount vote, he would not have been the 60th vote. How many of you remember that? So we're dealing with it now as the aftermath, right? Including the insurance and the terrible exchanges, whatever. Josh Upper, doctor, Wichita, Kansas. Write it down. He's been on shows. You can find him. He's now taking his practice, and there's 600 doctors across the country emulating him. What does he do? $50 an adult per month. Child, $10 per month per child. Unlimited visits, including home visits and visits to the clinic. If you need medicine, prescriptions, he charges reduction of 95% off its cost because he can do it underneath the collective bargaining. He also takes a percentage of your money that you're kicking into the clinic. There's five doctors serving about 300 or 500, I don't remember the exact number, of clients. Okay? But everybody's covered 24 hours, seven days a week underneath Josh Humber's plan. Direct patient, doctor, health care. No insurance in between. He also has catastrophic health care insurance. He buys that as a group discount for his members in case you need that, like a brain surgery, or it's a life-threatening disease, or whatever, right? That's not care under normal care. 
Make sense? Look them up. That's one possibility. Would you consider putting a commission in the state of Minnesota so we can get back to the grassroots of what we need for health care solutions rather than kind of like deciding from the governor's office or the doctor's association, shoving it down to Minnesotans that may not need it or don't want it or can't afford it? Yes? Would you consider that if you were a governor? Consider that plan. Or to bring Dr. Umber to share with you how it works across the country. It's one alternative. Another one we have is Wisconsin passed a bill. What other governor candidate is going to do yeah. about health care? I got those questions coming up. Order, order. order. <laughs> one moment, then I'll pass it to Sue quickly. Wisconsin passed a law signed by Governor Walker anti microchipping. So, against your will, if you're microchipped, if your child under the, and the minor is not being uh, approved by the parents, the penalty is $10,000 a day until it's removed as a penalty for microchipping in Wisconsin. If that was passed by the legislature in Minnesota, the House and Senate, would you have governor sign the anti-microchipping law here? Yes. Oppose the microchip without being involuntary. In other words, if you're okay. involuntarily. Okay. George, I'm you done. anybody else appalled that we're talking about the yeah. to try and collect $30 million for a mistake they made. Would I make the effort? Yes. But realistically, it's probably not going to happen. So what would I do as far as Minsure is concerned? Like I would do a lot of and I'd say, there isn't going to be that anymore. It's going to stop right here and right now, and you're going to have to come to me with a viable plan that makes some sense. And they will come to me, they will have a plan, and if it makes sense, I will consider it. But one can create plans and say, well, if you have a plan, well, here's what's wrong with that, and here's what's wrong with that. People are going to have to come to me and tell me what is the plan that they have that they believe reasonably serves everybody privately in this state at a reasonable cost where they can get health care that they need. So actually the uh, health care eligibility and enrollment debacle began in 2003. This is 15 years ago, people, where the health match system failed in its development, and by the year 2008, they pulled the plug on it, and since then, 15 years, we have not had a functional system in state government to determine eligibility and then enroll patients. And you know what the actual solution is? Get government out of it. Yeah. So I have a healthy Minnesota plan that takes the nearly one million people that are currently getting their health care through the state government through income adjusted vouchers out into the private sector, actually getting their health care like everybody else, health care that's priced for them, the benefits for them, that they want and need for their family. Look it up in, the, in my materials and maybe we can spend more time on health care in a minute. <laughs> um, so I think we all agree Minsure's been a disaster and we do not need it anymore, but that doesn't solve the healthy insurance problem for Minnesotans. And I think it's, it's really important that we as candidates are sharing with people how we're gonna actually solve the problem, not just get rid of the, the rotten computer system. And for me, that means more choice and more competition. 
And uh, I, I could give you a long list of things, but with competition, if one thing of many that we can do, I'm not convinced that the feds are going to be able to allow people to buy across state lines. We can do that regionally in a compact with our neighbors. That increases competition. I have more to say, but I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we'll all agree to get rid of the Minsure computer system. Um, because it's only a minute question, I will tell you that I um, have an advisory cabinet through this campaign, a health care cabinet with 15 individuals on that cabinet advising on policy. Um, we are looking at patient responsibility, being able to choose their own doctors and their own coverage. And to need that, you need price transparency. And the system needs to support that. Also, for the competition within it and policy that promotes innovation in healthcare to make sure access, quality, and cost are low. Um, and those are the highlights of the program. Thank you. They, I, I don't think it does, but I did put it out in an, a letter, so I'd be happy to, I mean, in an e-newsletter, I'll get it for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. yep. I think George described a good plan just by the example of the doctor. Uh, so get back to privatization and make sure that we I understand, again, we've said it before, insurance or access is not care. And a plan like you demonstrated would provide care, and that's what we need to get back to. No, if I had my way, we'd spend an hour on health care. How about three days? Well, a three day work I got another question. One more question, and then we'll switch over to this. So, I want to, before you ask that question, I'm going to ask, I've got two comments. The gentleman here, Glenn Brunhagen, now representative, when he came back from the Marines, he needed to have a living to earn. But my mentor of his, he started selling health care insurance to Delray Dairy Farm. How would it be 30 years ago if we could have something like this, where every time you pay in premiums, when you pass away, you get, or your spouse, all the premiums are returned back to your family. That's what his plan did. Also, I forgot to mention health savings accounts. Combined with Dr. Josh Umber's plan, where you as an individual, if you run your own business, pay into it, or if your employer pays into it that your business for you, or if you work for the state or local or whatever government agency, they can contribute to it. But that money is yours from birth to death. And when you pass away, that account and its balance, if you're frugal and don't use it all up, can be passed on to your heir or heirs. If you like that idea. Uh, if you're governor, if that was passed by the legislature, would you sign into the law? Health savings account. Thank you. Uh, this question is for all of you. It specifically says the Aaron Murphy campaign. But I got to tell you, I think every DFL governor's candidate supports uh, the end game of government run health care. How would you address that proposal when and if you're governor? It's a non-starter. Non Can I say more about it than just that? Uh, because that is going to be the issue. Part of our job as candidates is to frame the health care. We lose this issue all the time. And what are, what are they going to say? They're not going to call it single payer. They're going to say you can buy into Minnesota care, which sounds really good to a lot of people. We have to make Minnesotans know where they want to go, which is single payer, because all of them have said that. And here is the bargain. Everybody in this room loses your insurance. If it's, if it's employer provided, if you're doing it on your own, we are all under the same government plan. You will probably lose your doctor. You will probably end up having months long wait. And oh, by the way, your taxes are gonna skyrocket. And when we explain that to people and pin that on them, we can actually win this debate for a change. I just wanna make one comment that it's not about when we become governors. Mark Dayton has proposed if you look at how he wants to spend the surplus, $58.3 million in there is to extend Minnesota care. And it's only for, I see you not, only for the biennium. So that is a step to universal health care. And then how is it going to get funded the next biennium, the next biennium, the next biennium? It's already happening, folks. Well, I don't disagree with anything that's been said, but if you want to win the election, you better have an alternative that is more compelling to people because I got to tell you, Medicare for all 
Minnesota Care for All is going to be an awfully enticing apple that the Democrats dangle out there. And I will tell you that my Healthy Minnesota plan that takes almost a million people, all the people on medical assistance, Minnesota Care, and Minsure subsidies, and puts them with an income adjusted voucher out into the private market where they control the benefits and the care and the plan and the price that they get. We have a chance to go on offense with this issue and not just explain how crummy their idea is, but to tell them, who do you want controlling your health care? The government or you? We can win that debate if we have a proposal that puts it that starkly. Minnesota Care, Medicare for All, whatever you want to call it, we got to have an alternative. I think the alternative that wins is, who do you want controlling your health care? The government or you? And my plan gets us there. Aaron Murphy's uh, plan does not stand a chance, and that's why you need to elect a Republican legislator from your district. That's the best way to deal with this, to make sure it does not happen, to make sure that you have a plan that makes sense. No one of us can do anything to help you if you do not elect Republicans to the legislature where they control it. That's the best remedy on a going forward basis. Are you sure? The Republicans gave them $600 million last year to bail out Minsure. Thanks. Yeah. Are we Republican going? friends like that. Excellent. Are we going to immigration right now? Yeah, yeah. yeah we're going to immigration right now. What was the question? <laughs> I'll lead off with a quick couple of things real quick. No. Given that the governor of Georgia or Washington, D.C. would send National Guard troops from Minnesota to the southern border, will you do it or will you say how many you want? If President Trump's administration, Homeland Security, asked for National Guard troops to help with border security, as governor, will you send and comply with the request? Yes or no? Can we answer that another than yes? Yeah, that's not a yes or no. Yeah. So if we don't need them on the northern border and we don't yeah. need them around the Great Lakes, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the truth. Well, and I believe in protecting the borders and our rule of law. And, and um, President Trump has done it under Rule 34, which allows governors to make that decision. So the first thing I would do would be to consult and ask questions on, you know, what he needs them for, how many, and have that conversation and be in consultation with experts. Uh, but most definitely support securing the borders and our rule of law. So we'd very much consider that. Yeah, I, I am the same way. I, I would be very open to that because I think that is actually an appropriate use of the National Guard. I think sending them to Iraq maybe isn't. Uh, but if they're staying in the country to protect our borders, I'd be very open to that. Actually, no real disagreement here on this question. Uh, the governor has an obligation to uh, make good judgments and good decisions about the deployment uh, of our troops, the troops that we have to control, and so I think it would have to be a discussion. Uh, but conceptually going in, uh, I think his decision to put uh, troops on the ground at the border is a good one, and as a state in the union wanting to support our president, uh, my going in position would be yes, uh, let's just figure out the right way to do it uh, from here in Minnesota. All right. No equivocation for me. I would be on the bus going down there with them. <laughs> Governor Dayton and almost all Democrats have been pushing for driver's licenses for illegal aliens. Yay or nay? Absolutely not. Uh, next question. How will you stop is the Islam relocation program? So the first thing we're going to do is make sure we expose right here in Minnesota about half of the of the um, subcontractors that work with the volunteer agencies, about half of them are front companies and shell companies that only exist on paper to launder money to extremist groups inside the U.S. and overseas. We're going to expose them. We're going to expose those who enable them. We're going to expose those who have allowed them. We're going to expose legislators and the current governor who have been briefed on this and have been told the public the truth about it. 
and make sure that we have a, an attorney general like Doug Wardlow that uh, prosecutes these people. So the problem with the refugee resettlement program is that it uh, violates the 10th Amendment. It's the federal government telling a state how to spend their own money. Here's the other problem. When states like Tennessee decide to get out of the refugee resettlement program, there's a current agency rule from the Federal Health and Human Services that gives that state authority to the volunteer agencies. That violates the Constitution in that that's a legislative power, not an agency power. So the first thing I would do is I would call up Donald Trump and tell him, you've rolled back a whole lot of regulations, that's one you've got to roll back. Because that power belongs in the, le in the legislature, in Congress. And then we can determine the states and the city should have a right to make those determinations on the resources that are or aren't available and the effects on, of, on their community and make those decisions. That's a state and community decision, not a federal government decision bringing, bringing that mandate down, telling states how to spend their resources. So there was an article in the Pioneer Press, and I actually couldn't believe this, but it was a, a truly honest article about this, and it showed that over a five-year period, I think that ended in 15, Minnesota hadn't just taken in more refugees per capita than any other state. It had taken in more refugees per capita than all the other states combined. Oh. All 49 other states. If, if you count people who came here initially and then came from other states, primary and secondary. So, Minnesota, we have certainly done our part, and it's because we've had a governor who's opened his arms up and said, send everybody. The, the federal law says that the federal government is required to consult with states and localities before sending refugees over. Um, if President Obama were still president, he wouldn't do that, and I frankly think we would have to sue, because I agree with Mary that they are commandeering state money for a federal program, and that's a violation of the 10th Amendment. With the Trump administration, I truly believe that if the governor went out there and explained what we've done and said, you know what, we need a break, um, that would happen. Again, not a lot of disagreement here. I actually, uh, back in 2015, after the French nightclub terror attack as party chair, uh, called publicly for a halt on all Syrian uh, immigration into the state of Minnesota uh, because of the infiltration by ISIS. Um, I also put forward a safety and security plan uh, that focuses both, focuses both on illegal immigration, where our sanctuary cities are a magnet for illegal activity, and then spending is supported after that, and a pause on the refugee resettlement program until we can get our arms around it. Unbeknownst to many of you, the legislative auditor down at the state tried to get their handle around or their arms around the cost of the refugee resettlement program, and the finding was that they could not come up with the data to determine the cost, but that it was at least $200 million uh, per year. So until we get our arms around this and a handle on it, I think we need to have a pause, and we can work effectively with Donald Trump. I will tell you that on the Syrian uh, immigration issue, in 2016, there were over 6,000 uh, that came to the United States. In 2017, about 1,000, and in 2018, they're projected to bring in 11. So the Trump administration is actually making really good progress for us, so we need to work with them. I go everywhere to speak, given an opportunity. A few months ago, I went to Rochester, the United Church of Christ. I was the only Republican there. <laughs> and they asked some of these questions. And I was kind of stunned how many undocumented people were in that church. Out of 200 people there, I'll estimate 150 to 175 were there. They asked that question. And I gave my straight answer. No documentation, no money, no driver's license. No citizenship, no driver's license, no money. So one woman walked up the left aisle, clapping her hands, saying, undocumented, undocumented. She was relatively peaceful and they asked her to leave. But I said, you know what? You asked me to tell it to you how I see it, and that's how I see it. And that's how I see it here tonight. And the most effective way to deal with all of these issues is to say, 
the budget is before me. I will exercise my line veto item right. Any funding for any of these items will be automatically terminated. And your good friend and ours, Dayton now, has established line by veto. Line, 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 right line to veto is valid in the state of Minnesota, I'm sorry to say. So it would be effective. And that's what I would do. Stop the, stop the money. According to the FBI, Minnesota is a hotbed for Islamic Somalian radicals. Will you put your foot down and say no more refugees, or will you just cave in to the pressure of the PC culture? <laughs> oh. PC wouldn't be politically correct, would it? <laughs> Absolutely and unequivocally, I will not yield. And there are people in this room tonight who have dealt with me on other occasions. I've represented them in transactions. I'm a very successful lawyer. I do not yield. And I will protect your rights 100%. I will not back off on this. So if you want someone who is not going to compromise and say no to the refugee situation, as I articulated when I talked about my speech at the United Church of Christ, if you're not here legally, you're not going to get any money, you're not going to drive, and I will absolutely do everything I can to make sure that you do not get any financial assistance from the state of Minnesota. Well, I feel like we answered that question with the, the last line, but... I think this is, I know, Miriam is this different? thinking the same thing, too, but I think this is more of a reference, not to refugee resettlement, this is more about radicals and terrorists yeah. and, you know, some of the stuff that's going on in Minneapolis. Yeah. More of a criminal level. Yeah, well, well, actually, one of the other, yeah, thank you. One of the other components of my safety and security plan is to make sure that we are fully funding uh, the state's responsibilities with the Joint Anti-Terror Task Force, which many of you may not be aware exists. It's a federal, state, uh, uh, county, and municipal uh, task force uh, that is focused on uh, radicalization and recruitment uh, here in Minneapolis, and it's actually. Uh, I think a fairly well-functioning system. Uh, Sheriff Stanick is on it. Uh, periodically, I've seen information on it. Uh, they have brought in, as a matter of fact, uh, Israeli anti-terror uh, training elements to help them in this. So I feel like we have a fairly robust capability, but we've got to keep funding it. We've got to make sure that it's a priority for our governor, and it will be uh, if I'm your governor. So uh, two things on this for me. Uh, part of this is about refugee resettlement, which we answered, but we do have to be willing to say no to the federal government uh, much more often than we do right now. Usually what they do is they dangle a whole bunch of money in front of us and say, if you want this money, you have to do what we say. Sometimes we gotta say no tonight, and we just have to explain to the people of Minnesota why it's not worth it. But the other piece for me, when, when we're talking about um, you know, terrorism or what is going on in Minneapolis or Islam, it is hard to have these discussions. You all know this in our society today. And we need a governor who is willing to call that out and be really straightforward, not in a way that is, is angry or threatening to people, uh, frankly, in a way that is, um, that, that makes people more comfortable, but we can't be pretending like this isn't a problem anymore because those on the left have decided that they're going to shut everybody down who doesn't agree with them, which is fascism, and we need a governor who's willing to push back really hard on that. Right, right. I'm going to break the law and pay the price. So I most certainly would continue funding the anti-terrorism. Um, it's a, It would be a high priority. Thank you. I have, I'm going to say something a little bit off the topic and then come back to the, what I see as the main topic. I've been leading this charge for over a year, almost a year and a half, actually since 2014. And some of my colleagues have actually recognized me for that. I'm not trying to be emotional, but I'm thanking you, all of you, for the fact that you're expressing such knowledge that wasn't expressed a year ago. It's when you're talking about an intelligence officer, a US Navy veteran who's been serving for tw nearly 20 years, and we have been trying to tell leadership what's going on. You don't, I'm sure some of you can understand where I'm coming from from this. So this, to me, this question is actually about Sharia. Yeah, right. So the fact is, is we have a culture here in Minnesota. It's not even about culture. It's not about race, color, or creed. This is about an antithesis to the United States Constitution that wants to institute a level of law enforcement and a punishment 
to the people that is unconstitutional and inhuman. It will stop. It will end. talking about postmodern Marxism openly. <laughs> it is a nice change. Thank you. 
that may want to become a sanctuary city or county, that they're not going to get state funding anymore. And I guarantee you that will end very quickly. They'll sue us, but we'll, we'll win that fight. So that's, a, that's an easy one for me. But there is this, this bigger picture of the federal government telling us what we can and can't do. And I touched on it earlier. Uh, but I, I just think it's very important that we are willing to stand up and say no. Uh, and my thought is, if I see the federal government coming down with something I believe is unconstitutional, Obamacare would be a great example of that, I will refuse to spend Minnesota money to enforce an unconstitutional federal law. It's, it's, that's how you solve that problem. Okay, no, I agree, and uh, I've got a handful of specific things that I've actually already proposed. Uh, one is to uh, cut off uh, local government aid to sanctuary cities. Another is to go into the education funding formula and make sure that we appropriately cut off the slice of education funding that state taxpayers are paying for people who are here uh, illegally. And there are others, especially in uh, the health and human services arena, I have proposed that we put a one-year waiting period on availability and eligibility for all Minnesota offered social service programs. Uh, we are one of the fastest places uh, to actually help uh, people who come here uh, to avail themselves of benefits. So there's a handful of specific strategies that we can use uh, to get at uh, sanctuary cities. Respect to the um, 
Safe Child Act. I have not seen the actual wording in the Safe Child Act, but I'll, but I'll tell you this, our Minnesota courts need to put our children first in child custody cases. It can't be the fifth thing they look at. Um, and so I would support reform where in the child custody area, the welfare of the child would be paramount when they're determining that. And thank you to whoever sent the information and the links because I was able to look at that. Um, it was heart-wrenching to see what happened when the children were, were put first. And so I would certainly consider looking more at that act. I haven't seen the wording in it, um, but would most definitely be looking at that. Thank you. Well, specifically, I would support the Safe Child Act. And more broadly, with respect to family court, I was uh, chairman of the Civil Law Committee for two years when I was in the House, and we dealt with these uh, items a lot. And it's amazing the pushback you get when you try to change anything. Uh, but I was somebody who pushed hard uh, joint parenting legislation and would as governor because I think that would help at least take some of the bias out of the system and treat parents equally. I think that's important. So not knowing all the details of the uh, Safe Child Act by going in position with the limited a bit of research that I could do before tonight, I would support it, uh, and certainly in concept. Uh, and I agree with the abuses in the court, and we have tried for years to try and balance uh, custody uh, over there, and it keeps getting shot down. And you run into the advocacy groups, and you know what? They're not on the side of the victims. Nope. Mm -mm. Right? You learn this really quick. They're supposedly the victim advocacy groups, but I'll tell you what. They're protecting a system and a structure uh, that they're all part of. So I, I understand this. Um, it brings up a broader uh, uh, question of judicial accountability. Um, I have supported taking the incumbent label uh, off of judges on the ballot. Uh, I have fought the Queen Amendment and uh, judicial appointments. Um, and so I think there's a, a broader judicial accountability. And frankly, the legislature needs to step up and kind of honor its constitutional uh, commitment or powers to actually hold the judiciary accountable. My position on it is this. Every person in this state should be safe, wherever they are and wherever they go. I don't care who it is. Man, woman, child, I don't care what your gender is, I don't care what your religion is. The most incapable of defending themselves are the children. Some of the things that are done to these children are reprehensible. Recently, we have seen in the newspaper some despicable acts by some adults, what they did to their children. I cannot even begin to comprehend that. But we do have a system that is not responsive. They go through 27, probably, cycles of send the file to somebody else. I am a decisive person. If I had my way, I would have effectively a SWAT team I would go to Jim Backstrom because I know him long and well. I'd go to Pete Orpot in Washington County, only because I know these two. It's not that they have any magic. And I ask them to be a part of a task force. Tell me when these types of charges are being made against adults, against innocent children, how do we get in there swiftly and have an effective remedy to protect these defenseless children? some years, he was black. When his first wife died, he got remarried, he asked me to be the best man at his wedding. I have friends across all levels. And just because someone says I am a racist or I'm this or I'm that, I don't buy that. That's an effort to attempt to step up some type of a discussion that is meaningless. So if they truly believe that, they can hire a lawyer and I'll meet them in court to defend all their rights. Kate, you want me to read it again? For the last eight years, liberals inside and outside of government have focused on civil rights and minority rights, almost to the exclusive of everybody else's rights. 
How would your administration address this topic? Is there a proper way to address real or perceived racial or ethnic inequities in state government and in society at large? Well, it's actually not just the last eight years. It's progressivism in its entire history, starting literally in the early 1900s, um, where they started to undermine uh, the classical liberal uh, tradition that we are all created in the image of God and that we are endowed by our creator with those inalienable rights, that every single person in this room, every single person out there is valuable. They are created 30 seconds. <laughs> 20 seconds. But thank you. Well, I said 25, but I'm trying to speed things up because he's not going to let me ask the rest of my questions. Ask a lot of great questions. All right, so, so just uh, 25 seconds. Identity politics in this state and in this country are just completely out of control. It's all we seem to care about anymore. And the way, the, the proper way to handle this is to say it is illegal to discriminate based yeah. on race, color, creed, or any of the other things. Let's enforce the law. Simple. I agree that, and I would just add that one of the examples of the bullying law that was passed um, in the state legislature, and. I believe that law needs to be repealed and changed with local authority going to the school districts to decide that um, and with parents educating those kids on that. And that's just one example of the identity politics that has been going on for years and years and years. We are to protect everybody's First Amendment rights. Everybody's. Woo! Minnesota is one of the most wonderful places on earth to live. It really is. And every time this subject comes up, I think about my mother. And if we really want to stop this notion of racism and all this bigotry and hate, we start treating each other like citizens and respect the human condition and stop talking about all the race, color, creed issues and start dealing with each other on a level playing field that we are all citizens of this country, of this nation, of this state.
That's the epitome right. of the one world order, the epitome of the globalist that wants to try and take this away from hard working, decent people. And that's you. Whatever you do tonight, whoever you're supporting tonight, for goodness sakes, you go out there and give yourself at least one promise that you will spend every day from now to election doing one thing every day to get one of us in the governor's office. I want to be your governor. I want some of these people to be working with me, not against me. And the one world order globalists like Tim Pawlenty are going to pack their bags. Yeah.
not yield a position which, when I take it, is sound. I have made a sound decision by asking Michelle Heaven to be your next lieutenant governor. So I want all of you to visit with her afterward tonight and invite her to speak because we are going to have women in our administration. Power to the women. Let's start with Michelle Heaven and Lance Justin Dunn. Thank 